The last part of the chapter 14 material here, our final glimpse of what was going on in the Baroque period. Part 6, still in the north of Europe. The Dutch Republic. So this is a beautiful landscape by Jacob von Rausdale. It's a view of Harlem with bleaching grounds showing the Dutch love of landscapes with religious undertones of Noah's flood. I don't know where they get the Noah's flood thing, but oh well, that's uh, an interpretation for sure. So Jacob van Rosdale was one of those specialist artists who painted landscapes, and landscapes were extremely popular, especially as more and more people moved to the cities. Um, they'd like to have this sort of fake window hanging on their wall so that they could look at it, and it would be almost like looking out on the countryside. So that's um, really what landscape paintings do. Um, the sky of this one, if you look at it in proportion to the ground in the painting, it's most of the painting is the sky. So Van Rousdale has given a lot of attention to the clouds and very little to what's going on below. Um, but he has used the light, the light that's um, the sunlight that's coming through those heavy clouds to illuminate the field in the foreground that's a bleaching field where uh, weavers, people who made uh, cloth, who were wove the cloth, put it out to be dried and bleached in the sun. Um, so that's what those long white stripes going across the field are. I think it's a beautiful painting. I love um, Van Rousdale's landscapes for sure. <clears throat> and another specialist is Rachel Rausch, who's, uh, as you can tell, she's a woman. And her specialist was still lifes, in particular flower pieces. And believe it or not, people would specialize in doing a still life, which is a collection of objects or flower pieces or animal paintings or landscapes. So um, artists were known for doing just one type usually. Um, Rembrandt, as you, I hope you remember, mainly did portraits, as did uh, Van Dyck, and also um, Franz Hals. Okay, so let's look at Rachel Rausch's flower painting. So uh, she was a sought-after flower painter in Amsterdam with a 70-year career. That's really amazing. Um, this flower still life may be less daring, but it is very sumptuous and scientific in its study. So you have no difficulty at all telling what these particular flowers are. Um, and she paints them with great, great meticulous care. Um, now I'm going to, to tell you something else. The, the, the Dutch people, um, why they, while they may not have a lot of religious paintings in their homes, they're not, not at the same level as the Catholics of the Middle Ages did, um, but they do like a, a moral element in their paintings. They want to feel that when they are enjoying their art, that somehow they are being edified, they're being improved or lifted up. So one of the moral lessons in a still life or a flower painting like this is that uh, there's a little message about the fleetingness of beauty, of life, that it's all transitory, that flowers may be beautiful today, but tomorrow, no, they're going to be wilted. And so there's almost always an element of decay in them. And so you can look at a flower painting and find something. Sometimes it's a wilted flower. Quite often it's an insect that has been stuck in there to remind you that uh, we will all die. Basically, it's a memento mori. So in this case, um, tucked down here at the very bottom, there's a little snail shell. And there's looks like there's another one over here. And uh, these paintings are painting with so much detail that you can stand in front of them and pick out more and more things if you were in the gallery with them. But uh, that's Rachel Rausch, a uh, flower painter. So here's another woman artist. <clears throat> this is one of the little side boxes in the text. A few of you have purchased the text. Um, but this is about sort of the evolution of science as a field in the 17th century. 
Ren, uh, Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes insisted on scrupulous objectivity and logical reasoning in philosophy. Um, Anna Maria Sibylla Merian was a researcher and artist who published The Metamorphosis of Insects in Suriname. And she traveled abroad with all these explorers who were suddenly going around the world and trading and establishing colonies. Um, that's another issue we're not going to get into quite yet. Uh, but she studied the flora and fauna of distant lands and did these drawings and brought them back. Then books were made and they were purchased. People were, were very interested in things that were foreign from these faraway lands that they had only heard about. So that's what uh, this is all about, illustrating that. <clears throat> so um, this is just an illustration. This is a painting of Vermeer's that I just thought would be appropriate here with this text slide. Um, and it illustrates what I was just saying about science coming to the fore in the 17th century. So Nicholas Copernicus published on the revolution of heavenly spheres, which asserted that the earth revolves around the sun. Oh, it was world shaking. This was furthered by Johannes Kepler and Galileo Galilei, the latter of whom was put on trial by the Inquisition, that arm of the Catholic Church that wanted everybody to believe the right things. And at that point, the Catholic Church said the right thing was that the earth was the center of everything. Anton van Leeuwenhoek increased magnification of viewing lenses. And so this is the context in which these Dutch artists are, are painting, are doing their work. And um, Vermeer actually painted a couple of different uh, scientists in his painting. So I showed you one here. It's called The Geographer. I um, thought you'd enjoy that. Okay, that's enough of the Netherlands of the Low Country. So now we're going to go back into a Catholic land, into France, and we're going to see something that will maybe blow you away. I don't know. Um, so in France, we have absolute monarchy was exemplified by the rule of King Louis the Fourteenth, Le Roi Soleil, meaning the Sun King. He gloried himself in art as the Sun God Apollo. He really um, chose to identify with this Greek god Apollo, and there's a lot of imagery of Apollo in his house as well, and you might get to see some of that. Uh, this portrait by Iacin Trigo accentuates his legs with drawn back robe and high heeled shoes. So the king had a court, and around him he collected all of these aristocrats, these French um, people who were wealthy landowners. And they love the latest fashion. They, uh, it, you know, it's it's a whole different world. I can't even begin to describe it. However, there are some pretty good movies that give you a um, a good idea of what it was like. So France became the cultural center of Europe under his reign. This is new. It has not been France before, and now it is. So France is the center in the north. Here's his ancestor, Francis I. We saw him earlier. He was the one who had remodeled the hunting lodge of Fontainebleau and uh, Louis XIV there on the right. You see how fashion has changed. Both of these men, of course, would have been wearing the latest fashion. Um, and then everybody else follows them. So here's some art in France, from trade guilds to academies. The Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture was founded in 1648, smack in the middle of the 17th century, with corresponding Royal Academy of Architecture founded in 1671. So here's some art from France in the 17th century. It shows um, a variety of styles done by different artists and even a piece of architecture that is the Louvre Palace up there. Um, the Louvre is really huge, and it was added on to several times, but that's one of its earlier sides. And this painting is one that I used in one of my um, really brief videos about depth cues. So if it looks familiar, that's why. 
Um, yeah. Now, to continue on with the idea of Louis the Fourteenth, so we're going to more or less dwell on him for the rest rest of this lecture because he was the the center of the cultural world of France. So this um, small chateau at Versailles was built into a grand palace to seat the king and five thousand aristocrats. Yes. Um, André Le Notre planned the gardens with precise geometry and harmony. So um, this had originally been a hunting lodge and it was out in the country outside of Paris and it was on kind of swampy ground. So um, Louis d decided that he wanted to move outside of Paris. He thought Paris was too full of danger, of intrigue, and he wanted to create essentially his own little capital where he had absolute control over who came and went, who was uh, allowed inside, and it was way out in the country, so it was kind of isolated like that. So he did this remodel, and we're going to talk about his model at Versailles, his this is the back side of the palace, and we'll look at that. This is one of the statues on one of the many ponds in the gardens. Um, so here's, here's one sketch. I'm going to show you several of the grounds of Versailles. Uh, so you can see down here where it says Chateau. This is the, the building I just showed you. That's Right there, that's one of the little ponds, the little pond I just showed you, the reflecting pool, and that was the back side of the building. And all the rest of this, and I'm going to show you several, these are all the gardens and the grounds that were like a huge, huge park for the use of the king and his courtiers. So just those 5,000 people that he allowed into his presence, um, they could hang out there all day and they I don't as far as I know they really didn't do any work they would discuss things and make decisions and sort of lord it over all the peasantry of the lands and of course they collected taxes um, this is what happened to the swamp it was channeled into this uh, canal the Grand Canal that was used for pleasure boats. So the king and his friends would have these little barges. And they were they were not humble. They were not simple. They were very ornate and very elaborate. And they would just float. Of course, somebody else would have to push them. Um, but float around the canals. One barge might have a little orchestra on it. Um, and people would be partying well into the evenings when the weather was good. So Versailles is a monument to self-indulgence. It was designed by a team of uh, Levaux, the architect, Le Notre, who did the landscaping, and Le Brun, uh, the fine design. Formerly, it was a hunting lodge on swampy land, like I told you. Let's go back there. Uh, three avenues led to Versailles. Now, I'll show you another. This is an aerial shot today. So there were three roads. Just notice how symmetrically the whole thing was planned. So this is one road. I believe this road to the right was the road from Paris. And then there was a center road and another road here. And then this is the courtyard. Uh, so if you arrived on a coach, your coach would come up here and you would get out of your coach and go to the inner court and then go into the palace. Um, and here you can see all of these uh, geometrically planned gardens. These are called parterre gardens, um, which was very ornate. These were visible from the palace. And then beyond that was the wilder part where there were forests and um, little openings and fountains and pools. Also out here, there are several other buildings. Um, I'll show you some more pictures of these. So this is huge. I should have the number of acres this covers, but that has never, um, never occurred to me to get the acreage until right now. So here's another view. Um, the one, the view just before it showed uh, tour buses because tourists come out from Paris to visit this and then car park on the left. But this is an early morning view, so the um, it's, nobody's here yet. 
but it's beautiful. And you can see the Grand Canal. Here you don't get such a, a view of the parterre gardens, but instead it just looks like forest out there. So it's, um, it, it is lovely, but it was very indulgent. I mean, people were starving. Um, the common people paid for all of this with their labor. So here's a plan, a period plan, showing, again, Versailles. And this building right down here is the palace. And all the rest of it was private. I'm sure this, this indicates a wall that was around the outside. You've got to keep the peasants out, so they would not have been allowed in at all, period. Um and a period painting. This is an imagined elevated view. There are several of these that exist. They seem to be popular in the 17th century. I find them fascinating because nobody, I mean, there weren't even hot air balloons then. So of course there was no flight. There was no way anybody in there could have gone up high into the air and uh, painted a picture or even done a sketch. So it's completely from the imagination. But it shows over here on the right the road that came from Paris with um, carriages and people on horseback riding up to the court of Versailles. And you can see still the parterre gardens behind and the Grand Canal out there. Uh, so obviously they're still here. Now on the back side of Versailles is the one room we're really going to look at closely on the inside of the building. And this is the Hall of Mirrors. So it goes along, it's a long chamber along the back side of the palace at ground level. Um, on the inner wall, it's completely covered with mirrors. And mirrors were extremely expensive at this time. And so these are huge mirrors. Um, it's difficult to imagine in t terms of today's money how much this palace would have cost, but it was a lot. So you have mirrors on this side, and on the opposite side, the outer wall, you've got these arched uh, windows that let the sunlight in. So this area is full of sunlight. It streams in through the windows and hits the mirrors, and then it's reflected. So you can see how buoyant and light it is. And for the evening, then there are all these beautiful crystal chandeliers that are loaded with candles that the servants would have lighted so that the guests could have enjoyed it. So the Hall of Mirrors. Um, the room is 240 feet long. Um, and there are two large square rooms on either end of this. Uh, one room, and you can see the doors to it down there. One room is the Salon of War, and all of the paintings within that room uh, have to do with uh, the God of War, who's Mars, also known as Ares. And the other room is the Room of Peace, who's usually personified by Venus or the Goddess of Love, um, Venus, also Aphrodite. So um, you've got these, these two extremes on either end. And I suppose, I hope you've noticed the ceiling of this room, which is a long, very long barrel vault. There's lots of gilt gold. Um, it's very busy, very decorative, and yet the ceiling's been divided up into painted panels. And the subject of all these paintings is the Sun King himself, Louis the Fourteenth? Yes, he had uh, war at one end, love at the other end, or peace at the other end, and in between, it's all about him. So the, these guys had tremendous egos um, and narcissism. This one I included uh, this painting of the back or photo of the backside just to show you where the Hall of Mirrors is on this. I'm, I tried to figure that out. Also this is a link to a beautiful um, promotional video that I found about a, a virtual reality program. Apparently it's free. I think it was maybe paid for by Google. Now I can't remember. Um, but the link to it is in Canvas, so please give it a look and 
if you have a VR, that would be a really fun thing to do, I think, because you can just turn your head and walk through the whole palace. How awesome could that be? Um, so here's another view. You can see the painting a little bit better up there. I'm not going to interpret the painting. That's not really the point. The point is just to see this uh, overdone palace. One of my favorite things, though, is the, are these little... Um, these candelabras on the right and here's a detail so these golden women are holding up these like giant torches that actually are light fixtures so um, they're functional they're they act like they're physically holding up the the torch the light isn't that great a um, couple of more views. This on the left is the queen's bedroom. I just wanted you to see. I mean, this is an extensive and a huge place. And on the right is a view to today or, you know, approximately today of the exterior of people, tourists walking into that inner courtyard where, of course, the coaches would have delivered um, the early people to visit. This is called the Room of Presence in English, and it was the room where the king would sit on his throne when he was doing kingly things, like if he was receiving a monarch from another country, a monarch or an ambassador, um, or if he had to make any rules or hear any arguments about anything, this is where he would do it. So this is where he did his king business and the rest of the place was all you know about his pleasure and recreation i just wanted you to see uh look at the ceiling all the gold decoration around it um yeah this is how that king lived this is the chapel at versailles the private chapel just for those people again those extremely wealthy aristocratic people the 1%. I'd say it's even less than 1%. And here's some more views. I just wanted to include these. This is kind of new to my show, but um, the the wife of Louis XVI, who will also live here um, two kings later, is Marie Antoinette. You'll hear about her later. And she wanted to pretend to be a peasant, so she had this little uh, farm. It's called her hamlet, uh, Marie Antoinette's Hamlet, where she could go and dress like a peasant and pretend to milk a cow there. So that's kind of legendary. And then these buildings are were just pleasure pavilions. They're just stuck out in those gardens for people to go have parties or to, to have rendezvous with your lover. Um, and this is the, a grotto, and the sculptures in here have to do, they're sculptures of Apollo. So there we go, the sun god. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> so that's it for Versailles. And I just wanted to give you a big taste of it. That was really the, the ultimate style and the taste leader of France. But it's not everything. So there's one last little mention. And this is a French painter, painter Nicolas Poussin. And he has a completely different style. He pursued his career in Italy. His landscapes are not true to life. They don't look naturalistic, but rather very carefully constructed and carefully ordered. This is his landscape with St. John on Patmos, and it shows a clearly defined foreground, middle ground, and background marked with alternating sunlight and shade. And we look at this because Poussin seems really different. He, he is subjects are uh, based in the ancient world, so he wants things to look classical. And he's kind of foreshadowing a very important movement in the next century. And this is neoclassicism. So um, just kind of keep in mind that Poussin was there, Poussin was doing it, and then other people caught on. So that brings us to the very end of 17th century, the Baroque period in European art.